Welcome. I am so glad to be here and see so many familiar faces from last year. Um, welcome to all the youth. I hope you'll... Yes. I used to come to Camp Wooten as a, as a child. I believe I came for the very first session that it was held here at Camp Wooten. I think I was eight years old or something like that. And so that this place, and, and then there was like a long gap of like 30, 35 years when I didn't come and then started coming last year and found that it hadn't changed, like in a good way. I mean, the, the campus hadn't changed at all, but there was still that, you know, the, the same spirit was here that, um, that I remember so clearly feeling when I was like in first and second grade and, and um, attending children's classes here. And I feel like you have, my Baha'i identity was shaped in a very, very important way here at Camp Wooten. Um, it's always you know, symbolized for me a, um, a, like a, a, a bubble of serenity, you know, in the midst of the, in, in the, midst of the, the world, uh, like an island, you know, apart, uh, very much so physically, it's so hard to get here. <laughs> but also, uh, the fact that we're cut off from the internet is wonderful, uh, and it just helps, you know, it helps with that feeling of just being in this wonderful spiritual bubble. Uh, of course, outside is the world, um, this maelstrom of, of energy, um, of, of things falling apart and coming together at the same time. Um, we are, we don't know what to think about the world. I mean, as Baha'is, we have some idea of what to think about the world. We have a, a vision of where things are going, which is incredibly positive. Uh, and, and some might say utopian, um, but it's a, it, it's a vision of, uh, of the world coming together. But what we see instead um, of that is, uh, is a world riven by, by conflict, um, a world that, uh, and, in, and because it's riven by conflict, uh, people at, at the nation, at the national level, are, are, are unable to, to get their act together to join forces to, um, to, to solve problems that are now emerging at a global scale, problems like how we're affecting our environment uh, and how the, the climate is changing. We are seeing a world where the differences between the rich and the poor are getting are getting more and more uh, extreme you know, to the extent that maybe the world's 10 richest people control about half the wealth at this point. Um, and that trend seems to be, seems to be get, getting even worse. We're seeing in the last decade or so, particularly of uh, this resurgence of tribalism, of nationalism, of people um, contracting within their own limited boundaries of what they consider to be us. Uh, and um, against everyone else. And all of this is, is happening at the same time that all of these wonderful things are, ha are happening. It, it's a century of, of darkness at the same time. It's a, it's a century of light. And, uh, and the world is, is progressing forward at such an incredible breakneck pace. The technologies that are being, uh, that are being evolved that are reducing human suffering, that are increasing the length of human life, that are feeding, you know, so many more people, uh, that are enabling people to come together and communicate uh, at, at the instantaneously. There, there's, the list could go on. Um, and, and so one, one wonders, hey, how, do you, how do we look at the world? How are we supposed to, um, how are we supposed to address its, the issues facing the world uh, from, the, from our perspective as Baha'is. What do we have to offer this world that is in such a state of, of confusion and in a state of, uh, of things going so amazingly well and so, and so terribly at, at the same time? Um, how can we contribute in the world um, our understanding of what's really happening at a, at a at sort of at the largest scale in the historical in, in the historical sweep of things, you know, not just in terms of what's happening this year, what's happening in this election cycle, but 
how can we contribute our understanding of the spiritual processes that are at work in the world? And how can we demonstrate to the world a, a clear vision and an example of a, of a community that's, that's working to fulfill this, this vision that we have? Ultimately, what it comes down to are ideas. Uh, we, can, we can bring to the world ideas that no one else has. Uh, and a working example of these ideas in our, in both in our individual lives and, and in our communities. Um, because what the world, I mean, the, the, the world is lacking many things right now, but what I think it lacks most of all are, is the right idea of how to move forward, the right kind of narrative, the right sort of picture of what the, of what the big picture is. It ultimately is I, ideas that transform the way we think about ourselves, that direct the course of civilization. Um, and I think even more than economic factors or the, the weather or, the, or you know, the things that, that on a shorter time scale affect human civilization. Of course, the ideas that we're talking about and the ideas that, that as Baha'is we're trying to deliver into the world um, don't take root uh, quickly. They take root over a time scale of generations, over human lifetimes, even over centuries. And so we have to take the long view of things and realize that what we're doing in the world is uh, the results of the seeds that we're planting uh, may only really be seen uh, into the uh, beyond our lifetimes and even beyond the lifetimes of our, of our children. There is a, I think, a, a current narrative. If, if what, and, and when we're talking about what are the big ideas that we're bringing into the world, um, if if we were to try to maybe summarize in a sentence or two, you know, what is it that we're that we're trying to tell the world currently? What language are we using? What words are we using? One way to put it is that. From our perspective, the, the world was created by God to know and to worship him. Uh, God sends prophets at historical intervals every thousand years or so. Uh, these prophets bring books. These, bro these books define a practice and they define a community. Uh, they embody God's eternal covenant in the world. Uh, and the Baha'i community is the latest of this uh, chain of messengers in the world. We have a book and we have a plan. Uh, we have a series of plans actually, uh, taking place in five year intervals uh, with all sorts of things to be done to execute these plans in the world. Um, one could say that's kind of our, our big picture, you know, if we were to say this is kind of how we see things. Um, what has the response been in the world to this picture, at least, at least in the West, at least in this, this part of the world? Um, I think it's fair to say that the response has been tepid. You know, people are not that interested in hearing about God these days. People are not that interested in hearing about one more religion because as we all know, religions are the source of our problems, so why are we bringing one more religion into the world if religion is the, is the source of our, of our problems? Uh, it's as though people in the West, in the, it's particularly the secularized West, and we're living also, I think, in a very you know, secular part of the, of the world. Um, just people are no longer engaged by this kind of narrative, by this kind of talk about what the big picture is. It's not fundamentally new to people. You know, people are, are used to hearing about, you know, there are all, all sorts of very active you know, church organizations that are propounding their messages of God's, revel God's revelation in God's book and, the, and, the, and the, the plan of God for humanity. So why am I putting it in these terms? It's because what we have to bring to humanity is truly new. 
It's astonishing. It is the wine of astonishment. It is the, um, the choice wine that's been unsealed by the fingers of might and power. Um, it's something that will transform the world fundamentally. But people aren't getting it. People don't understand that what we have is new. Perhaps in part because we haven't yet found the language in which to describe it. Perhaps in part because the language that we're using to describe it um, is, the, is in terms of these old ways of thinking about, uh, about religion, about God, about the ultimate meaning of things. It's hard not to do this, of course. I mean, one has to use words to express ideas, and the words that we use come from uh, our background, come from, you know, when we look at where the Baha'i community, most of the Baha'is come from, they come from Christian, a Christian background or an Islamic background, uh, by and large. Um, and so it's not, it's not surprising that then that they bring into uh, the faith, the, the, the conceptual framework uh, of, the, uh, of, those, of those communities. But is our conceptual framework identical to that conceptual framework of the existing Christian or Islamic communities? Uh, is it that we have this new wine that we're delivering to the world, uh, but we're putting it in old skins? You know, the old warning in the Bible is that if you try to put new wine in old skins, the skins will burst. I'm not sure exactly why that is chemically, but they say that that's what I'm talking about. Try to put a new wine in old skins. So we have this new wine, but are we putting it in old skins? Um, and just to emphasize the newness of it, and we have so many beautiful passages in the, in the Baha'i writings that emphasize how new this is. Baha'u'llah says in gleanings, O ye that inhabit the heavens and the earth, there hath appeared what hath never previously appeared. There's a, a letter of Shoghi Fendi where he says, the Baha'i should not always be the last to take up new and obviously excellent methods, but rather the first, as this agrees with the dynamic nature of the faith, which is not only progressive, but holds within itself the seed of an entirely new culture and civilization. And elsewhere, the Guardian also writes, this is in one of his published letters, we need a change of heart a reframing of all our conceptions and a new orientation of our activities. The inward life of man, as well as this outward environment, have to be reshaped if human salvation is to be secured. Shoghi Fendi also writes that the mission of Baha'u'llah signals the advent of an organic change in the structure of present day society, a change such as the world has not yet experienced. So we have all these indications that what we have is truly fresh and new and different. Are we presenting it to the world in terms that bring people to understand how fresh and new and different it is? Do we ourselves understand how new and different it is? Shoghi Effendi writes in, one of, uh, in another one of his letters, and I think this, makes, this forces us to think about, well, what is it that's new about what we're bringing to the world? He says, the world has, and he wrote this in, I think, 1946, the mid-1940s. He says, the world has, at least the thinking world, caught up by now with all the great and universal principles enunciated by Baha'u'llah over 70 years ago. But we know that the deeper teachings, the capacity of his projected world order to recreate society, are new and dynamic. It is these we must learn to present intelligently and enticingly. So what are these deeper teachings he's referring to? If the thinking world has already caught up with the universal principles enunciated by Baha'u'llah, and I assume he's talking about principles like love and unity, elimination of racism, social justice, service to others, equality of men and women, extremes of elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty. These are great and universal principles that the world is already caught up to. If we, if we say this is what we believe in, most people in the thinking world would say, well, yeah, I, I believe in all these things too. 
So already half a century ago, Shoghi Effendi was saying, there are deeper teachings that we need to appeal to, to present the faith to others. He didn't unfortunately say, and those deeper teachings are <laughs> the following. He kind of left it up to us. But we know that there's something new. We know it's not the, it's not the top shelf, you know, 12 principles that are on our, you know, on the cards that we might share with people. It's something else. And that something else is that's the new wine. But if, if we, do we even know what that new wine is? Do we even know what these deeper teachings are to, to be able to, uh, to present uh, to others? So it is the, um, the um, um, I think, impossibly ambitious uh, goal of the next few days to think about this question. Uh, and if not to answer it, because I mean, I'm certainly not able to answer that, that question. It's a question that has to um, evolve uh, you know, over, over the course of time and over the course of you know, the entire Baha'i community encountering this revelation and extracting from it, uh, diving deep into it, not just skimming the surface, but diving deep, in, deep into it to extract the pearls of wisdom which, are, which are, lie hid within its depths, as Baha'u'llah said. You know, the, the pearls of the revelation are not, are not easy to find. You know, Baha'u'llah says they're hidden in the depths and we have to dive deep to, to get them. Um, so, so the next few days will be uh, a, a bit of a deep dive um, and it will be in part my personally sharing the thoughts that have occurred to me that may be connected to uh, the, the deeper teachings of, of the Baha'i faith. And they're ultimately inspired by, and the whole perspective of, of the next few days will be inspired by a statement um, commissioned by the House of Justice called One Common Faith a few years ago, which is on overall on the topic of the, uh, of the unity of religion, the principle of progressive revelation. Uh, and in the statement, something very astonishing is said uh, that underlines the points I've been making about the newness of it all. It says that Baha'u'llah has not brought into existence a new religion to stand beside the present multiplicity of sectarian organizations. Rather, has he recast the whole conception of religion as the principal force impelling the development of consciousness. It's worth reading a second time because this is, a, I think, a, a, a really key point this made, and it's going to underline the next, the next several days. So let's hear it one more time. Baha'u'llah has not brought into existence a new religion to stand beside the present multiplicity of sectarian organizations. Rather, has he recast the whole conception of religion as the principal force impelling the development of consciousness. So, this is going to take a, a lot of, of time to unpack, but if we, how do we think about the Baha'i faith in terms of, not in the terms that come very naturally to us, which is, this is a new faith community defined by its own prophet, its own books, uh, its own membership, its own funds, its own properties. Okay, that's a way of thinking about it that sets it alongside all the other religions and sectarian organizations. It sort of puts it on par. It's like, well, you can, you can be a member of this faith community or any of the other thousands of faith communities uh, in the world. If Baha'u'llah didn't come to do that, if he didn't come to just raise up one, one more option among the many thousands of options we already have, uh, what did he do? And the statement says he's come to recast the whole conception of religion as the principal force impelling the development of consciousness. So what we'll talk about it over the next few days will be an attempt to address some rather big questions, um, but all in relation to this question of consciousness and recasting and trying to rethink uh, about what the Baha'i faith may be in terms of consciousness. Uh, consciousness as it as it has evolved throughout the cosmos, you know, from the moments of the Big Bang to the present day. So there's going to be all sorts of opportunity to bring in 
principles uh, from modern physics and science, and ultimately, uh, I think this class was labeled as a class on science and religion, so there's going to be plenty of that. Um, but I think above that, it's not just, we won't just be talking about science and religion in the Baha'i faith, but we're going to be talking more broadly about, about this idea of consciousness. So, just to very briefly preview the, the themes of the next five days, today we'll be talking about history. Uh, how did we get here? Uh, tomorrow we'll be talking about the physical world. How does science understand and describe reality? And this is important because how science describes and understands reality can provide us keys for social and spiritual transformation. Uh, so that's tomorrow. If tomorrow is the physical, then the next day will be on the metaphysical. So the third day will be on the metaphysics of this idea of consciousness at a cosmic level. Um, so we could say it's going to be addressing the question of where are we going? You know, where is the world going in the sort of biggest, biggest scales? Then the, the fourth day, I do have five days, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> then the, the, fourth, the fourth day, we'll, we'll talk about mysticism. Um, and we'll talk about the individual human experience of becoming conscious. And then on the fifth day, we'll talk about world order, or the collective human experience of becoming conscious. So we'll talk a bit about the physical world, the metaphysical world, and then we'll talk about the individual and the collective. So those are the kind of the overarching themes of the next, uh, of the next few days. But I want to start, first of all, by talking about a little bit about history. Um, why history? I mean, isn't history like the most boring subject? Um, <laughs> Uh, for a lot of students uh, in school, this is just a collection of facts which are of you no know, real intrinsic interest. Um, uh, it just records the daily lives of, uh, uh, or records events and people who uh, are long dead and, uh, and no longer matter to us. Um, and one way of thinking about history, um, and I think one way that a lot of people think about history, is just that. It's just, it's just a record of a sequence of, of events that happened in the past. Um, who ruled this kingdom from, from this year to that year, and uh, when did this war take place, and how many people died in it, and when did the borders of this or that country change? You know, for a lot of people, when they think of history, that's what they think of. This kind of, it's, uh, it's just the. Um, it's, it's a mishmash of, uh, of events and people and, uh, that, that ultimately have no larger picture or, or larger coherence to them. Um, one can choose to look at history in this way. One can choose to look at the history of the world, both human history and before it, the history of life on planet Earth, and before that, the history of the cosmos. One can choose to look at them in that way, through that lens, as just a bunch of things that happened. Uh, and historians like to collect these things, just like a rock collection, you know, and put it in chapters for the convenience, convenience of the reader, uh, and, and force students in school to read about these things and take tests on them and so forth. One can think about history in this way. Um, and actually, Baha'u'llah addresses this way of thinking about history um, and admits that there's a grain of truth to it. So he had a good friend who happened to be a Zoroastrian, was not a follower of his, but was a, a friend of his that he knew from his days in, in, uh, in Baghdad. Uh, his name was Manakji Saheb, uh, and Manakji Saheb uh, learns of, of Baha'u'llah's prophetic claim later on, you know, years later after Baha'u'llah was now living in Akka. And Manachi Sahib wrote to Baha'u'llah a series of questions. And um, among these questions, it's almost as though I mean, one can imagine Manachi Sahib thinking, well, now that, you know, now that you're a prophet, you, know, you can answer me, you know, maybe you can answer me these questions that you didn't answer me over, over coffee in the, you know, in the bazaar in, in Baghdad. Uh, and one of the questions that he asked Baha'u'llah was, 
about basically the, the there's four schools of thought in the world. He asked Mahalo, and he says, well, one school of thought is that basically everything is God. Uh, and another school of thought says that God created the world and he sends prophets every now and then for our guidance. That one sounds kind of familiar to us. Um, and, then he, and then he gives these other two schools of thought and I'll read, I'll read what, how he describes them. He says, yet another school holdeth that the stars were created by the necessary being whilst all other things are their effect and outcome. These things continually appear and disappear even as the minute creatures that are generated in a pool of water. This is like kind of a strange way to describe a school of thought, but it evokes this idea of there's no, definitely no active God in history. It's just kind of things happen. You know, maybe God created it at the beginning. There was a necessary being, uh, but things just kind of afterwards just kind of do their own thing. One could translate this into the word deism, which is a, one way of looking at the, at the, at, at the world. If God created the world and kind of let it run on its own. Then he gives the fourth school of thought. He says, the fourth school of thought maintaineth that the necessary being hath fashioned nature through whose effect and agency all things from atoms to suns appear and disappear without beginning or end. What need then for an account or reckoning? As the grass groweth with the coming of the rain and vanisheth thereafter, so it is with all things. If the prophets and the kings had instituted laws and ordinances, the proponents of this school argue, this hath merely been for the sake of preserving the civil order and regulating human society. The prophets and the kings, however, have, have acted in different ways. The former have said, God hath spoken thus, that the people might submit and obey, whilst the latter have resorted to the sword and the cannon. And then Manashi Sahib asked Mahalo, which of these schools of thought is, is correct? And uh, it's interesting, this, this last school of thought basically is there's no rhyme or reason to anything. It's just, and even if the prophets have said anything, it's only just to keep people in line. You know, it's not because they're necessarily telling the truth of anything. Uh, and, uh, and everything is just like the grass growing with the coming of the rain and, and it vanishes. So it is with all things. So he asked Baha'u'llah, well, which of these schools of thought is the right school of thought? And you might think Baha'u'llah would definitely exclude the third and fourth schools of thought, right? Because they don't, they don't indicate the active um, intervention of God in history. They, they say nothing about that. It seems to, you know, it, it's, it's a very kind of atheistic way of, of looking at the world. And Baha'u'llah's answer, which is, which is a rather extended answer. I won't, I won't read the whole answer, but basically Baha'u'llah says, refer this question to the statement I made earlier. And what was that statement? It was, um, be anxiously concerned with the needs of the day in which ye live and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. So that was the answer to the question. What, what kind of answer is that? <laughs> It's almost like Baha'u'llah saying, this, this, the, this theoretical consideration doesn't really matter. What this, you might think that this is a really important question because this question seems to drive at the very heart of what, this, what the meaning of everything is, you know, is did God create the world or didn't he, right? You'd think that that's a legitimate question, Baha'u'llah saying, be, be worried about the needs of the day, you know, center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. But he goes on and says, he gives a certain precedence to the second school of thought. This is the school of thought which says that God created the world and sends prophets. Uh, Baha'u'llah said that school of thought is closer to piety. Uh, he uses a word which also is translated as righteousness. But then he immediately says, one can, however, provide a justification for the tenets of the other schools for in a sense, all things have been and shall ever remain the manifestations of the names and attributes of God. This is a truly incredible thing, I think, for a prophet to say when given an option, you know, given the golden opportunity to reject atheism and affirm theism, Baha'u'llah doesn't do so. He says, even these atheistic points of view, even these points of view that don't actively talk about God intervening in history, 
I said, even they have some truth to them. You know, there's something to that as well. One can provide a justification for the tenets of these schools as well. So that's, a, I think, an interesting starting point to begin rumination on perhaps um, another view of history, which might be expressed through different kind of language. You know, this is trying to find a new skin to put this new wine into. Um, and this, this new way that will try to look at, 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 at history. Um, although, although one can look at it as ultimately what we're describing is God's action in history, uh, it's a, that's one lens that one can look at it through. And one can also describe uh, the, the action of the divine in the world uh, through, through other means, through other language, through a different kind of a skin. So what might that be? Well, first of all, you, we, we mentioned that you can look at history just as a jumble of facts that you're forced to learn and, and that, are, that it is of no great interest uh, to anyone. Another way of looking at history, which, we'll, which we will uh, pursue, is that it, is, it represents a record of the collective motion of consciousness from one stage to another. Um, and this is trying to link it back to that statement by the House of Justice about the about the um, about Bahala coming to you know to to change our idea of religion as the principal force impelling the development of consciousness. So, what if history and the movement of history um, has ultimate meaning and motion and direction to it, and that direction has something to do with consciousness evolving from one stage to the other? Um, and this view of history includes uh, all of cosmic history from the Big Bang forward. So this idea of consciousness evolving is not just our human consciousness that we immediately think of when we think of consciousness, but in a way, everything is conscious, in a way, you know, depending on how you define the word conscious. And in a way, uh, the planet Earth itself is conscious. You know, not in the way that it thinks about itself and what it's going to do today, but it's conscious in the sense that everything is deeply interconnected and everything affects everything else. You know, consciousness in a way is response to stimuli. At the very basic level, consciousness is when you drop a rock and it falls to the ground, you can say, the rock is conscious of the earth, otherwise it wouldn't fall to the ground. You know, at, the, at the most basic level, consciousness is the law of gravity. It's, it's the, the fact that everything follows the law of gravity. Um, that's one way to think of consciousness on a continuum that begins with things that are just, just as well described by the laws of physics, like electromagnetism and gravity. But as things evolve in complexity and grow uh, and, and, uh, and, and evolves into life forms first of all, of singular unicellular life forms and then life of greater and greater complexity and then animal life and then human life. One can see, a, we can, one can see a, a whole range of degrees of consciousness emerging. And of course, our consciousness, which we, which we see as the pinnacle of creation, um, and which may in fact be the highest degree of consciousness yet attained on this planet, is is not necessarily the, the, the end, end point of consciousness, but well, we know that it's not. I mean, it's gonna, consciousness will continue to evolve into the future uh, in ways that will be aided by our collective coming together. You know, the, the, one of the purposes, I think, of the, of the coming together of the, of the human race in unity, it's not just for its own sake, it's not just because the united, the united humanity is good for its own sake, it's good because it unlocks greater potential of consciousness on the part of the souls and on the part of those individual beings that comprise the whole that, they, that experience consciousness. So another way then of looking at history is that it's this collective motion of consciousness from one stage to another. Um, and, and so one way then of putting our, uh, this vision of, of the world and, and, and which, which tries and which we're gonna try to put in the context because we're gonna bring it back to this strange 
moment in history that we find ourselves where things seem to be falling apart, uh, where we're not sure what the future holds. One way of putting this bigger picture of history into words is that the world is waking up. Uh, and we're in the middle of this process of the world waking up. It's been waking up for billions of years, and it will continue to wake up for billions of years. Uh, and it wakes up in different places and different times in different rates. So it's not waking up at the same rate everywhere. There may be other planets, probably are, because the universe is a pretty big place, where consciousness has also evolved in its own way. Uh, at its own rate, uh, perhaps there are other civilizations in the universe that you get to be discovered, maybe never to be discovered by us, uh, that have attained far higher degrees of consciousness than us. In a way, the best evidence for this thesis, for this idea that history is not just a jumble of events, but history is the, is the, is the record of emerging consciousness, perhaps the best proof of that would be to find history happening on some other planet to discover life that has evolved in some other planet. Because as long as it's just this planet, you can always say, well, it was just a big accident. You know, as, long as, as long as the universe is filled with trillions of planets, and as far as we know, life has only ever evolved on this planet, and intelligent life and civilization has only appeared on this planet, one can always say, the skeptic can always say, it's vastly improbable. It just happened to happen. It just happened to take place on this planet, and there's no meaning behind it. Other than that, it was just a big accident. But um, once you start observing intelligent civilizations um, on other planets, with every observation, with every discovery, the chance that this is an accident drops drastically. You start suspecting that there's something working behind the scenes. You start suspecting that, well, maybe life isn't exactly an accident. Maybe the emergence of consciousness wasn't just an accident that happened to take place because a meteor fell on the Earth 65 million years ago and destroyed the dinosaurs, because otherwise, you know, we'd saw dinosaurs which had brains the size of peanuts and no consciousness that were, that at least that any kind of consciousness, like, like human consciousness. So, um, but that's, that's, that's kind of a side conversation of life on other planets, which we don't have to, to go into. How much time do we have left? I want to make sure I don't go over the time, and, and we only have an hour. About 20 minutes? Okay. So, what I'm going to attempt is summarizing world history in 20 minutes. Um, but seen through this lens. So, if we want to, if, if, we, if we think of, of, of history as a process of waking up, and it's a directed process, it's directed in the process of being awake, being conscious. It happens in stages. It doesn't happen at the same rate in all places. It's not, in some nations, in some cultures, in some civilizations, it happened before others. That's just a fact of, a, a fact of, of, of human history. Uh, things seem to be changing you know, too quickly in some places and not quickly enough in, in other places. Uh, it's almost as though, and, and as it happens, it's not happening in a gradual sense, but it's sort of, it happens in a sense that things go along kind of without much change for generations, sometimes for centuries, sometimes for thousands of years, and then suddenly there's a, a phase transition, you know, like when water suddenly turns into ice. Uh, or, uh, well, that usually doesn't happen suddenly, but like if you think of a, a super saturated liquid, you might have seen this in like science class or something where you have this liquid that's super saturated and then you just hit it or you just do something to it and then suddenly it crystallizes because it's ready to crystallize, but it needs that input of energy before it changes phase. Um, it needs a catalyst. And maybe that catalyst releases energy at the same time. Maybe it changes phase. Like you've seen these, these hot packs. Um, and, uh, and you bend the coin, and then the, the coin is the catalyst. And when you bend the coin, then suddenly the whole thing, like in an instant, the thing crystallizes. It was a liquid, and then it suddenly becomes a solid, and at the same time, it, re it releases heat. So it releases energy and changes phase at the same time. Civilization is kind of like that. You know, it's like, it's in a certain state for a certain period of time, and then a catalyst comes. 
Baha'is would probably say these catalysts are more, more likely than not to be prophets. You know, the prophets are the catalysts of human civilization. You know, they elevate human consciousness almost like a step function, almost like things are moving along a particular way. And then these beings appear, you know, who have such a degree of consciousness that, um, that they're able to catalyze, you know, a wholesale shift in consciousness in a, in a civilization. So human civilization then has been characterized by these movements, by these periods of stability, and then these rapid periods of change. And during these rapid periods of change, um, there's a lot of instability. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of uh, a lot of uncertainty. Um, and then it, it reaches that next stable phase. Now, this period, you know, when we when you bend the coin in the hot pack, that only takes a few seconds. But this phase changes in civilization. It's sort of flip from one form of civilization to another. That doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't even necessarily happen in a generation. Um, that phase change of civilization uh, may take centuries. Uh, and my contention is that we are presently in the middle of one of these phase changes in civilization. You know, and, and the understanding of where we are now, why things are so in, in such a, a weird state of there's great things happening and terrible things happening and everything is happening very quickly. Um, so quickly, in fact, I mean, the, 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 the change in civilization and technology just over the, the course of the lifetime of anyone in this room, whether you're 10 or 12 or 15 years old or, or 60 years old, has been absolutely astonishing. Um, and so astonishing that for everyone in this room, we take this rapid process of change for granted. We just, because that's all we are familiar with. And that's all really our parents are familiar with. And so we, we've, we're sort of on in this mode of thinking that, well, Life is just this rapid period of exponential change. Um, that has not been the experience of human beings on this planet for the vast majority of human history. For most of human history, things were just, you know, you could look back generations and really nothing had changed. Um, but there were some interesting transitions in human thought. I'll just name a few of them, and we don't have a lot of time to go into them in detail, but just sort of give you a picture of what some of these big transi transitions in human thought were. The first one, um, and you can read about this in, uh, in, in books by Yuval Harari, one of them is particularly called Sapiens, it's a very interesting book that talks about it. This first big tr phase transition happened, we don't know exactly when, maybe 100,000 years ago. Maybe it happened around the same time that modern humans appear. Um, but what happened in this phase transition was human beings suddenly, suddenly became endowed with abstract thought. The ability to think abstractly. We take this for granted totally. That wasn't always the case. Animals cannot think abstractly. You know, even higher primates, they don't think abstractly. They just think in terms of what they can see and they react to what they can see. You know, some limited ability to reason. But in terms of thinking about the future, that's like a huge abstract leap that suddenly enables you to plan how you plant your crops. It enables you to plan where you're going to hunt the next season. It enables you to you know, to carry on life in a physical way that otherwise animals are unable to do. Uh, it also, very importantly, enables humans to come together in greater configurations than just a family or a tribe. Before there was abstract thought, imagine how would you live with other people? How do you trust someone? On what basis do you trust that someone isn't going to stab you in the back or kill you and take your the deer you just killed for your evening meal, or, you know, how do you trust people? It's, pe it's because you have a personal relationship with them. You know them personally. Uh, and it's been shown that actually people, even today, we are not wired to have more than about 150 close relationships, like friends, people that we actually know. Um, this number 150 is an interesting number that comes out of numerous sociology experiences. It's called Dunbar's number. Uh, and it's about 150, and it's 150 in all sorts of different ways. People have tried to measure it in different ways, and they come up with the same number. You can't have more than about 150 friends. Of course, people have thousands of Facebook friends. Facebook friends, Instagram friends, we're not talking about those. We're talking about someone who, the way Dunbar described it was, someone who, um, if you walked into a restaurant and you saw that person, 
um, you, would, you would not feel shy sitting down at the table with them uh, and just kind of inserting yourself, you know, just having a seat if you, if you ran across that person in a, you know, in, 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 a, in a public place. You know, that's how he defines friendly. It's a low threshold. But even then, people only know about 100, you know, you can only know about 150 people. So up until around 100,000 years ago, the size of human tribes could not be bigger than 150. Because you couldn't really get to know and trust more than 150 people. Because our brains are not wired for it. Even though we're social animals, our brains are not wired for it. So you couldn't have a tribe of more than 150 people. Because how would you know to trust that person you don't really know? So it requires this leap of abstract thought before you have something bigger than just a family unit or a small tribe emerging. You need that abstract leap of thought before you can have hundreds of people all who identify as being a member of one tribe. And being a member of one tribe, there's a certain trust bond that, that exists between them. And there's a certain way that civilization can move forward on that basis that couldn't have moved forward uh, prior to this, you know, prior to that abstract leap of thought. So there's this, this is one great transit, and that's phase transition probably took a millennia. We don't know how long that, that took. But we, we know that something like that had to have happened. We can think of that as the birth of humanity. You know, the birth of, of, of what we consider as, as really the human race. What would the next phase transition be? Um, this is, you know, subjective and different people have proposed different things. But the next one might be the agricultural revolution. This, if, if the first birth of humanity was about 100,000 years ago, this would have been maybe 10,000 years ago. When we first domesticated wheat and corn and grains and animals that helped protect the lands that, we're now, uh, that we've now uh, planted our, our crops on. Um, of course, that requires us to be organized in, you know, in large enough groups that, that we band together for protection. It's this agricultural revolution that unlocks, though, the uh, this sort of leisure time that's needed to invent other things like culture, music, uh, to have time to invent things like writing systems, to need to invent things like writing systems, to determine who owns what plot of land and so forth. This all happened, this all happened around, uh, around um, 10,000 years ago. And that was one of these great phase transitions in, in, in human civilization. Another one happened about a couple thousand years ago. Um, and it happens, this one happened very strangely in, in, in a very similar way across the, the, the civilized world. Sometimes referred to as the Axial Age. And it happened between around 500 BC. Around the same period of time, both in, in China, in India, in the Middle East, in Persia, in, uh, in, in Israel, and in ancient Greece, this all happened around the same time, and I believe also in, um, in Mesoamerica. Uh, you have the, the, the philosophy of, of Confucius and Lao Tzu in China. You have Buddha in India. You have Zoroaster in, in, in Iran. You have the Hebrew prophets uh, in Israel. You have the Greek philosophers. All of this is with, uh, with say, two or 300 BC to, say, 800 BC. So it's a, it's a span of time around 500 years. But during that span of time, there is this conceptual leap forward in civilization where people now think about the world in a fundamentally different way. They now think about the world in axial terms. What does axial mean? It means there's an axis. It means there's, they start thinking about the world as, well, there is an axis running through things that differentiates this physical world that we observe from some invisible realm above. The idea of heaven basically emerges in the axial age. The idea of, of our being born into a physical world, but ultimately having our purpose being to journey to some other world. The idea that, there's, you know, that, that, that reality is a, is a building with two floors, and we're all you know, born on the ground floor, but, the, but our job and our purpose in life is to, is to get to that next floor. This is, in, in very, very uh, rapid terms, uh, the, 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 um, in summary terms, the, the this axial, the revolution of the axial age. Another major revolution that took place, and if there's not enough time to, 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 to describe it in the, next, in the few minutes that remain, we'll, we'll start our next uh, session with it, because it's very important for us to understand it. Happened or started to happen around 500 years ago. Uh, and we're still, I think, in the middle of it. 
it's a yeah at least a 500 year process and what happened what happened around 500 years ago the enlightenment which followed something else the printing press and which helps to spark things like the scientific revolution and and the enlightenment all these happened like 1500 1600 1700 Europe was the center, the scene of, of, of all of this. This was the next great leap forward in, in human civilization. What happened in the scientific revolution? What happened in, in, in the enlightenment that followed? Something really earth-shaking, something that we're still coming to terms with. Something that, that the, it was like, a, it was like a chain reaction got initiated and the dominoes started to fall. You know, what was the first domino that fell with the scientific revolution? It was this geocentric picture of the cosmos, that the, that the earth is the center of everything and the sun goes around the earth. Well, you have the, the observations of the first astronomers, of Copernicus, of Kepler, of, of Galileo, who, um, and really, you know, Copernicus is, is the one credited with, uh, uh, with the, the, the theory and, some, and initial proofs uh, that, well, maybe the earth goes around the sun and not, and not the other way around. Um, and before that, why did people believe the, the sun went around the earth? Well, because someone had written it in a book long ago. And because we believed on the authority of the person who wrote that book, that it therefore must be true. So in the 1500s and 1600s, and this, you know, the importance of this can't really be overemphasized, people thought of knowledge as something which came, which was revealed at some point or given at some point in the past. And we're all just following the greater wisdom of our forebears. <laughs> and that uh, across all modes of human life, that's how people thought up until the scientific revolution. So what, how you thought about how the universe goes, well, you go to Ptolemy or you go to some of the ancient Greek, uh, Greek uh, scientists. Uh, how, what about medicine? Well, you go to Galen, another ancient Greek. Uh, you don't actually observe the human body and, and, and scientifically examine it, or dissect it, heaven forbid, uh, and, and experiment with different sorts of remedies. You know, the thing that now is very obvious and second nature to us, that that's how you learn about the function of the human body. You know, back then, the way you learned about the human body was you read about it in a book. Or stole cadavers. Or so. <laughs> uh, and what about, what about politics? Well, who was in charge? Well, it was some king. And why is that king in charge? Well, because his father was in charge. And why was he in charge? Because his father before him. So politics was all about who was in charge. And the longer the genealogy, you know, the sort of farther back it went, the more authority, you know, you, that, that, particular, uh, that, that particular line of, uh, of, of monarchs had. That's another example of the, you know, of the power and truth and everything was something that was in the past no more so than in the realm of religion. So in the realm of religion, and now we're coming to the Baha'i faith, you know, in the realm of religion, you know, up until the enlightenment, up until the scientific revolution, the truth of things was always somewhere in the past. The authority, uh, the authority of everything was revealed in a book that was given a thousand, thousands of years ago. And all truth was to be found in that book. And so, the direction that humanity turned when, when the orientation of, of civilization, you know, as, as much as it had progressed up until the 14 or 1500s, was still fundamentally backwards in time. To get closer to the truth, you go backward in time until you get to the source of where that truth ultimately came from. You know, whether in the economic, the political, the religious, the medical, and, and any other realm. That's kind of, that was the thinking. So what happens with the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution, and we're still dealing with the consequences of that, and the world has not yet fully embraced the consequences of that in all aspects of its life. But once you have the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, that, that orientation of where is the truth to be found flips. So now our closest encounter with the truth is not somewhere in the past, in some old musty book. Our closest encounter with the truth always lies in front of us. Because as we continue to progress into the future, we learn more and we, we accumulate knowledge and the scientific enterprise and the enterprise of history and, the, and all the enterprises of human knowledge become cumulative enterprises where we add upon things that were learned by, by those in the past and we get closer and closer to the truth. 
So the idea of where do we find the truth and where is humanity you know, fundamentally going becomes more future-oriented than past-oriented. Now this has, I think, been fully understood and its impact has been more or less fully realized in the political realm, uh, in the economic realm, in the scientific realm. Um, no one questions anymore that we need to apply principles of, scientific principles of, of formulating hypotheses and testing those hypotheses in all these different realms. The one remaining realm where the, the light of the enlightenment has yet to fully shine is the realm of religion. Religion still is, it's like the last domino to fall. Even though the scientific revolution was four or five hundred years ago, the way the world collectively still thinks about religion is still fundamentally in medieval terms. People still fundamentally think about religion and look at, and this is, this of course, it is true of, of the most extreme versions of religious reaction, you know, reactionary, sometimes violent religious uh, sects like um, um, like, like extremist Islam, uh, as the as the you know, as a prime example today of those who just completely reject the modern uh, and reject everything about the modern age, because to them the truth lies in the sh Sharia law, which was revealed in the Quran and in the Hadith, and there is no revising of that, and there is no improving on that. And the best we can do is go back to that pattern of life that was established, really in the. Uh, in the Middle Ages on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and the best we can do not only is to go back to that pattern of life, but to impose it on the rest of the world, because that is, that's the ultimate and, and closest encounter of the human race with truth was, was with that document. So, we're gonna go further into this tomorrow, uh, and then talk more about the Enlightenment and what its, its influence on religion is going to be, and how the Baha'i Faith represents a continuous phenomenon which is part of the Enlightenment and not contrary to it. So, more on that.